Scott Pioli is a multiple-time NFL Executive of the Year who uh, spent many years doing it with the Pats and other teams uh, um, uh, around the league, Falcons, Chiefs, and uh, joins us now. Scott, welcome. How are you? I'm doing well, Mike. Thanks. I hope you're doing well and the family's doing well. Doing well. Thank you. Everybody's doing well. All right, draft night, a different draft. As we are a couple hours away, What's the thing the fans should look at, it, Scott, that will be very different because of what we're living through with this draft? Yeah, I think that because most of what the fans have always seen in the past is, um, you know, the draft cam- cams where they can see the their executives and their coaches in one room. I think it's just going to be visually different, just like it's going to be different for the people that are actually making the picks. They're sitting in isolation, and now I think what we'll pick – I mean, what we'll see as fans um, is the, the people in isolation. They, you know, it's interesting, Mike. I haven't heard about what teams are actually going to have draft camps, so to speak, um, available, you know, in terms of executives or head coaches out there. So it'll be really interesting to see um, who can be seen and who can't be seen. Now, um, with the people you've talked to around the league, executives, uh, anything noteworthy that you're expecting out of this draft that you might not have heard yet? No, I think we've heard a lot, a lot of what we've heard is, is true, Mike. I've talked to a number of GMs, a number of head coaches, a number of personnel directors, and there are people trying to move around. I, I think something that they've all made clear to one another, though, is, hey, we're open for business. A lot of the trade talk that we're hearing um, is not just smoke. It's people trying to move around. But I think we're hearing so much of that now, too, because teams are letting their their potential trade partners know ahead of time, listen, when we get to five minutes or four minutes on the clock, we are done. The deal needs to be done earlier than usual. So I think there's a little bit more preliminary work going on. So I think a lot of what we're hearing – uh, is true. Nothing really new and or exciting, but um, a lot of those trade rumors that we're hearing that people are trying to execute trades are actually happening. There's always a lot of nonsense but in the last couple of days, Scott, before the draft. Guys building their guys yeah. up, guys trying to promote their quarterback, guys trying to, to hurt other guys, etc. Never has there been more attention paid to a player than there is about Tua. Now, Tua's got a great resume. He's been in front of the world for a couple of years. We know about the injuries. Now there's been rumors of more injuries. There's rumors that he's off boards, that there's this, that he's going to sink like a stone. Can you separate what's real and what's not real with this player? Well, just a couple of things, Mike. You know, uh, you bring up a a lot of good points in that. And having been a part of 26 drafts, you know, I did know and hear of uh, teams or people with teams on occasion that would float rumors about injuries or um, being off of draft boards. And, and to me, I always felt like that was one of the more uh, or one of the most disgusting parts uh, of a draft. And it was far and few between the people that would ever do that, where they thought it as being business, that they wanted to float rumors and things like that out so a player could potentially fall to them. I just, uh, again, I just think it's a horrible thing to do to a human being. These kids work their entire lives to get in their, in that position. And when it comes to Tua, I have, you know, again, I've not spoken to all 32 teams, but I've spoken to quite a few. And I don't know uh, personally of any team that has pulled him off of their draft board. Um, and, and I know I think I've heard some of the same rumors that people have. It's not any of the teams that I've talked to. I think people understand that there's an issue um, with the hip. There's a problem. They're seeing him move. Um, and again, Mike, I, I, I don't know if we talked about this before, but I think what, what it's going to come down to with Tua is who's willing to take the risk and who's not willing to take the risk. You know, you go back a couple of years ago, Jalen Smith, who was arguably the best football player in the draft when he was coming out of Notre Dame as a linebacker, he had that horrible injury. I mean, he was beyond the ACL and LCL um, tears. He had nerve damage and he had drop foot. Uh, doc, some doctors believed he'd never even walk normally again. And there were doctors that believed he was going to be okay in time. One of those doctors happened to be with the Dallas Cowboys. And, um, you know, four years later, he's a Pro Bowl, uh, a, a Pro Bowl linebacker. Now, again, I think it comes down to Mike, who's willing to take the risk or not. 
the kid has such a resume, uh, I would love to have him a part of my program if I was running a program. I'm talking with Scott Pioli, of course, uh, multiple-time NFL executive of the year, won multiple championships with the Pats, uh, with Bill Belichick up in New England. Scott, we've heard about Detroit being open for business at three, okay? Everyone, they know they hope someone wants to trade in for a quarterback. Uh, they can't take a quarterback. We know that. We're an hour and a half from, from the start of the draft. So we are about two hours from there, pick a little less. When do they give up? Do they go right to the minute, or have they by now exhausted? Do they know whether they can trade the pick, or are they still trying to trade the pick? I think if they're they're open for business, they're listening to people, and I think, uh, you know, Bob is a smart person. Bob Quinn, I'm sorry, and Matt Patricia, they're both really smart. They've seen – They've seen it all. They were they sat in the draft room uh, and it, were in and around all those drafts with the Patriots uh, while I was there, and then even after I was there. And they know that, and they're also smart enough to know that there has to be a cutoff time. To me, again, I think the, the sweet spot number is if you better have it figured out by four minutes because there's so much to do, and you have to have be on the phone together with the league office, then allow the team that's acquiring to pick time to get a pick in. So there, I think that they know who's serious and who's not serious at this point in time. And you know, I think you you know when you're watching the draft sometimes and you're like, wow, they know who they're going to pick. Why are they sitting on the pick? Why haven't they turned in the pick yet? A lot of times, teams will sit there even though they know they have the player. They talk on the phone again in the pre-virtual draft to their person at the desk and say, listen, write this name down on the card, sit on it. I'll tell you when to take it. And what they do is teams sit there and wait and wait and wait until the last possible minute to see if any action is going to come, to see if there's, again, action that has a, a lot of currency and can really help them. And I think that's what the Detroit Lions will do. I think they've got a player. Well, I know that they have a player that they like and that they were planning to pick um, because they're in a spot where they know it, it's a, a variety of one or two players um, that can be – where the old borough is going to be gone then there's only one other player that they have to worry about being gone. So, um, But I think that they will sit and wait and give themselves to at least five minutes before they turn a card in. Talking with Scott Pioli. All right, Scott, the Giants at four. Um, they obviously don't need a quarterback. They can start the uh, run of the uh, offensive linemen. A lot of people think they'll do that. Uh, you know their new head coach. Uh, a lot better than most people do. Uh, how about his, he and Gettleman, and how about his role in this now tonight? Well, I think it'll be interesting because this is their first draft together. And the way I, I believe the Giants, again, I've never worked in the Giants organization, but the way that it's always looked is there has always been collaboration, but the personnel department runs the personnel decisions. And this is, the, they've had a couple of two, three months together now. And the, where they're going to go with this pick, um, I'm not sure because it depends on what falls in front of them. But I, I agree with you. My, my best guess is that it would be one of the offensive linemen. And then it comes down to, I think, the personnel department, Dave Gettleman and his people, making sure that they commu have communicated enough with not only um, Joe Judge, but also with Jason Garrett to have an understanding of exactly what Jason is looking for in the right tackle, right tackle or left tackle positions, and you know, and also making sure that the player that they're going to pick is going to fit the makeup of the head coach and the culture that he's trying to set. Because with those top four tackles, if you if you believe, I believe there's four that are, you know, you throw them in a bag, they're all different and similar, and then you pick the one that matches um, best what you want to do. I think that's what they have to do here is make sure that they're getting the guy that's going to fit the culture that Joe wants to have. When you when you do this, and we're talking with Scott Pioli, when you do this and you're picking fairly early. Now, you didn't pick early very often, but when you're picking early, you're picking 9, 10, even 8, right around there, and things go according to plan. When you go in that room that night, you've decided who you're picking, right? Unless somebody's on the board that you didn't expect. If things are got, you've, you've done your mock draft, you know what you're expecting, you pretty much know what, how this is supposed to come off, right? You have a good idea, and there's always surprises because you you can be looking at the teams ahead of you. You have an idea, right? Uh, let me back up a second. You spend months and months and months in the evaluation process of the draft, 
Then when it gets down close in the last month to three weeks, you start thinking about strategy and then you really dial in on the strategy. And the strategy really surrounds knowing the teams that are ahead of you, knowing what their needs are, and also having a bit of knowledge or understanding of some of the trends that the decision makers, uh, you know, what they've done in the past. That gives you an idea of what might happen ahead of you. So like, for instance, in the year that we, in 2001, when we, um, we picked Richard Seymour at number six overall. We had a really good feeling about what was going to happen. We hoped and prayed that Seymour was going to be the player that fell in and around us, um, and fortunately he did. Um, and there's been other times where if that doesn't happen, the player doesn't fall to you, you better have some a bit an escape strategy or the best player that you think is, go, is going to fit. You know, I go back to the year in Kansas City where we drafted Dontari Poe. We had three players that we thought might have a chance to land back where we were. And, um, you know, when, when it got down to the, I guess we were nine and it got down close and we were hoping that either Keekly, Luke Keekly or Dontari Poe were going to be there. And Keekly went right before us and then we grabbed Dontari Poe. So sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. How hard is it to trade up? We know it's easy to trade down. How hard is it to trade up in a draft? Well, it's 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 difficult. i got to be honest with you, Mike. It's difficult both ways because there's been times when I've tried to trade down. I remember in my first draft in Kansas City in 2009, we were in the number three slot. Um, there, there were a couple of players we liked. There was one player we liked. We felt we could, you know, move back without getting too cute and get that player. We did not find anyone that wanted to move up uh, for anyone. There were teams behind us that thought that that, that draft was very flat and wasn't very deep. Um, you go back and you look back at that first round, of that 2009 draft, um, and there, in, in retro, you know, looking at it from retrospective, of uh, you, there wasn't a whole lot of reason to want to move up. I mean, yeah, Clay Matthews ended up hitting, but he was a 20 some, you know, picked a 20 something. But, you know, moving back and forth is always back or up is always a great idea. The big thing is trying to find a trade partner while you're on the clock or while they're on the clock trying to get up. Scott, is it if a guy falls? like a sap did or there's a rumor like a Marino did and stuff like that. Do you have to have enough confidence where you say, I know what's about my guy. This is now a steal or is it just human nature where you say, man, they have to know what do I, what don't I know? What am I missing here? What's the news I don't have on this guy? Is that play into your head or do you have to dismiss that? You have to dismiss it, Mike, because again, if you're if you're a leader or and you have a good leadership group, because it, again, it never comes down to one person making that decision. The two or three people that are involved in that decision of picking a player, you have to believe that you've vetted everything. And now that information comes out prior to the draft. Like in the case of, of Warren Tapp, some of that information came out. Um, you know, I was not a part of of, of being involved in a draft. Uh, and not that old uh, for the warrants after act. But when you start getting information like that, you have to rely on your people. You can't get caught up in following the herd because more often than not, when you follow, follow the herd, then you're just, you, then you're going to be just like them. You have to do things and make decisions that are based on your values and what you're looking to try to do with your team. Um, the uh, Jets at 11, how about when you're looking at, maybe a fourth player, like the fourth best tackle in a group of four, or the first break in a seal on the offensive, you know, receivers, who you got a whole bunch of, and you can maybe get the best of the receivers. How about that thought process? Yeah, you know, Mike, I've always been, uh, I've had an affinity for the big guys up front and securing the best players at the offensive line. Um, you, you know, most of the teams that I've been a part of, um, if you have a great quarterback or a very, very good quarterback, he will make your receivers better. If you have a good overall offense, they will make the receivers better. Um, again, maybe part of, part of my reason for feeling that way is because of many of the drafts that I've been a part of, when we've gone high with the receiver, we've been wrong or we've been unsuccessful. So I just, um, if you, if there's a 
good. And, and I believe that those four top tackles, I really like those top four t- tackles. And I think that, again, depending on, on which flavor you like, um, that you're going to get all four of those top tackles, I believe are going to be starters for you know double-digit years and good players. I understand the importance, and everyone gets seduced by the sexiness of, of guys that are fast and skilled players and have the ball in their hands. Again, I just go back to the quarterback. If the Jets believe they have the quarterback that is that good, that quarterback will make the players, the rest, all of the other skilled players around him better. All right, two things that the fans hear all the time. Is it true or not true during the draft? Number one, do teams favor players from certain schools? You hear they do. You uh, the, not, the uh, Pats with Rutgers. Uh, do you favor players from certain schools? I think what they do is they favor players from certain schools if they've got really good relationships with the people there. You know, there's people that favor Iowa that have good relationships with Kirk Ferentz or Alabama with Nick Saban. You know, there was a time period when we were with, when I was with the Patriots, Bill had a very close relationship with Urban Meyer, and we picked a number of players that came out of Florida. So it's it's a it's the program, but it's more importantly the relationships from within that program. You know, at Rutgers, a lot of those players that ended up, again, most of the Rutgers uh, work with the Patriots ended up happening after I was there, and those were a lot of Greg Schiano players. And Bill knew that um, players out of Greg's program, could, you know, were coming from a similar culture and could fit with Bill. And, again, you know, Stephen Belichick, um, brought Bill's oldest son, was at the at Rutgers during that time, um, so where a lot of those Rutgers players came from. So I think it's more about the individuals they have relationships at certain schools. But yeah, there's a lot of that that goes on. All right, what about the idea of relationships in the room? The idea he have heard this tonight. Oh, if the Pats, if a quarterback slips, the Pats can go to their buddies at thirteen, the Niners. They're their trading buddies. They can deal with them, or they can deal with the Lions, or they can deal with this team. Do you have any friends during the draft? Are there relationships that you can count on, guys who worked for you, stuff like that? Does that hold up during the draft, or it doesn't hold up during the draft? It does hold up, but someone isn't going to make a trade just to make their friend happy. But you prefer doing business with a friend for a couple reasons. Um, You know a friend isn't going to screw you. And again, it was one of the interesting things that I learned, you know, working for Coach Parcells in, in New York at the Jets. And when he was there, he had this, re- he, he thought it was very important for him to have a relationship and a connection with someone from the other conference, someone that wasn't going to be a direct competitor. And I, I learned a, turn, a ton from Ron Wolf. Ron Wolf would come to um, our practices and spend one or two days. And then there were times, you know, I would go out to, to their practices. And I remember when we first went to the Patriots and, and Parcells was at the Cowboys, you know, we, we did a little scout exchange there. And what you could do is you end up doing business with people that you trust and that, you know, aren't going to try to, you know, tuck it to you and people that are you, you in order to do trades, you don't want to beat someone in a trade. I, I I'm a firm believer in that. You don't want to beat people in trades. You want trades that are going to help both sides. Because the react, even though they're competitors, they may not be direct competitors in that moment, but you want to be doing business with someone that you trust. And if someone tucks it to you or you do it to them, that's one less person you're going to be able to do business with. And those relationships for trades generally do start with people that have some history together. All right. Uh, and Scott will be back with us tomorrow. We'll do the same thing tomorrow night from 6 to 7. You think Tua goes early tonight or does he fall? I think he goes early, and, and truthfully, I hope he does. He, he, he's, he deserves it. He's earned it. He's the kind of guy that, again, is good for football and good for the National Football League. So I believe he does, and I hope he does. Thanks, Scott. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Thanks very much.